I really want to do some tutorials on text classification. It's the thing that students ask about the most. It's an incredibly useful application of machine learning and deep learning. But before I get into neural networks applied to text classification, I really want to start with the kind of more old-fashioned methods because they're incredibly useful. If you have less than hundreds of thousands of records of text, you almost always actually want to be using simpler methods than LSTMs and convolutional neural networks and the kind of more complicated stuff that people think of these days. So in this video, we're going to start with very practical, simple methods applied to text classification. And it'll be a great foundation for when we do a class on applying LSTMs and CNNs to text classification. Let's walk through how you'd build a text classifier on a custom data set. So if you haven't taken any of my classes before, then you need to check out my repository at github.com slash lucas slash ml dash class. And then go into the directory video slash text dash classifier. So here's the real world challenge for today. And it's a problem that I see all the time that companies want to do. We want to take tweets about a brand and classify them as positive or negative. And actually, I have some real world data here that was collected by my company, Figure8, about Apple products. So we have tweets from that conference, South by Southwest. And we have people saying positive things about Apple products and negative things. And from that, we want to build a classifier that can look at more tweets about Apple products and say if they're positive or negative. So I have a file with a few thousand tweets of labeled data called tweets.csv. You can open this thing up in a text editor, Excel, or any other program. You can see that there are three columns. The first column is the text of the tweet itself. The second column is called emotion and tweet is directed at. And that's actually which product the tweet is talking about. And then the third column, confusingly titled, is there an emotion directed at a brand or product, is actually the sentiment of the tweet. We need to load this data into Python. So to check out how to do that, open up load-data.py. Here, lines three and four load some incredibly useful machine learning libraries, or just numerical computing libraries, called pandas and numpy. And then line seven uses pandas to read the CSV file into what's called a data frame. You can think of a data frame as a two-dimensional array with named columns. Line 10 uses pandas to select a column from the data frame and put that in a variable called target. This is actually the sentiment of the tweet. Line 13 takes the column that corresponds to the actual text of the tweet and puts it into a variable called text. Line 15 prints out the length of the text just to make sure we've loaded the right thing. Let's give that a try by running Python load-data. And sure enough, we see that we have 9,093 lines of data here. Now we have to do something called feature extraction. What is feature extraction? As we keep talking about, machine learning algorithms have a very simple and very constrained API. They take in a fixed length set of numbers. They generally don't take text, audio, or images as input. So we need to turn each one of these tweets into a fixed length set of numbers. There are many ways to do this, but a surprisingly powerful way to do it is something called bag of words. Now let's put this into practice. I open up feature-extraction-1.py and I see that the first five lines of code are the same as my load data script and just load in the data. Now, from scikit-learn, I import the class count vectorizer. Count because we're counting words, and vectorizer because in math, a fixed length array is also known as a vector. Line 13 initializes my vectorizer, and line 14 fits it to my text, which runs through all my tweets and sets up a column for each word. Now, let's just run this before we go any further to make sure it works. And sure enough, we get a strange error message. One of the really tough things about machine learning, and I keep talking about this because students are always confused by it, is the confusing and lack of error messages. And actually, scikit-learn is probably the friendliest machine learning library in terms of clear error messages. But it's such a low bar that with this error message, I even have trouble with knowing what's going on. And so unlike every other machine learning tutorial, I want to talk about debugging. And I want to show you how I actually debug this. So I look at this, and I see that it's saying it's an invalid document. Maybe it's a Unicode error or some kind of text encoding error. 
And what I do is I see if it can load in a subset of my data. So I open back up feature extraction dash one, and I tell my count vectorizer to maybe just fit the, th the first three lines of text. Now, that actually works. So there must be something after the first three lines of text that's breaking my feature extraction. So maybe now I try it in the first 100 lines of text. OK, and this breaks. So there's something weird going on in the first 100 lines of text. And I can either do binary search, or I can open up my file in a program like Excel and see what's actually there. Now, there's a super suspicious line here, and that is a blank tweet. And it turns out that this is the issue that we're dealing with. Scikit is actually throwing up on blank tweets as input. And if you open up feature dash extraction dash two, you can see what I did to deal with this. So here, in line 11, I set fixed text to be text, and then I use a pandas idiom to remove the values of text that are not null. So this is going to remove every tweet that doesn't have a null value. And now in line 12, I set fixed target to also be the target values where the text is not null. This kind of data processing and cleanup is where you would really spend most of your time if you built machine learning classifiers in the real world. And I'll tell you what a lot of students would do at this point, and actually a lot of colleagues I've had would do at this point, is instead of removing these values in the code, they would remove them in the input data. And I strongly recommend not doing that. Once you start to change the input data, you can create lots of problems that will show up in production, which you wouldn't be aware of. Now, my fit command works, and so I can print out the length of the number of words in the vocabulary of the count vec. So here, count underscore vec dot vocabulary underscore in this last line is actually how many columns we have, which corresponds to the number of words that it sees in all of the training data. So when I run feature extraction dash two, it prints out 9,706. This is one of the fuzzy things that makes machine learning a little different from traditional statistics, even though the line is a little blurry. With a normal regression problem, we might have one or two columns of numbers as inputs and thousands of examples. Here we have 9,706 columns as inputs and a single column as an output. In fact, we have more columns of data than we have rows of data. We have more features than we have examples of data to look at. All FIT did was set up the transformation. Let's actually do the transformation and get this data into this column form. So open up feature-extraction-3.py and take a look at line 17 here. So line 17 calls count underscore vec dot transform on the fixed text. This line actually turns the fixed text into counts. Note that scikit always separates the FIT method, which should be run once and sets everything up, and the transform method, which doesn't change the underlying object, but turns some data into another type of data. So it turns the fixed text, which is a list of tweets, into counts, which is a matrix where the rows are individual tweets and the columns are counts of individual words. And we can do this more than once. So here, just for pedagogical purposes, in line 19, I set my counts equal to count underscore vec dot transform, and I give it two fake tweets that I pass in, love that iPhone and hate that iPhone. And then I print out the values. So I can run feature-extraction-3 and have the output of love that iPhone and hate that iPhone. And you can see that it outputs six numbers. And actually, this is notation for a sparse matrix. Really, what it should be outputting is tons of zeros and a few ones. But what it does here is it outputs six ones, because it's not showing me the places where it's a zero. So what this is saying here is that row zero, column 4,573 is a one. And row zero, column 5,169 is a one. And everything that's not output is actually a zero. Now that we have this transformation working, we're ready to build our algorithm. I want to note before we move on that we've actually made our most important choices already. And there's a lot of implicit choices that we've made. So for one thing, how do we deal with capital letters versus lowercase letters? Is the word happy all caps? Should that be a different column than the word happy lowercase? The answer is it really depends on what we're doing. How should we deal with punctuation? 
In this case, we're actually removing, we're stripping all the punctuation. But you know, with tweets, actually exclamation points, commas, periods, they really do have some meaning that we'd probably do better to pass through. And there's actually something really, really important that we're dropping here, which you really should not drop if you want to have a very good tweet classifier. I'll give you a second to pause the video and think if you can guess what it is. Welcome back. What is I it? I think it's ingrams. I think it's the relationship between words because you're just, you're just storing information about a single word. But... I think it's negation. So we have two guesses from our audience here. So they're kind of similar, right? So the guess was maybe it's engrams or, or sort of the, we've dropped actually the order of words. And in English, order of words certainly matters. And it's a really good observation that squashing it into these counts of words totally drops the order of words. And Rada pointed out that negation could be a major issue, right? Because you know if you say not good, we're going to count that there's a good and we're going to count there's a not, but we have no sense that the not happened just before the good. So negation is going to be a big problem with this algorithm. But there's actually even a more kind of fundamental thing that's maybe special to Twitter that we're dropping here that wouldn't matter in the Wall Street Journal corpus that we're linguists are kind of used to dealing with, but when people do Twitter, they often forget something. Hashtags. Slang. Hashtag slang. These are also good guesses. Emoji. Emoji. That's the big one. So actually, this system we have right now is completely stripping out the emoji, which strips out a lot of meaning um, from the tweets. And it sort of shows you that if you take a, um, a language processing expert that's used to, say, books, processing books, they might struggle in a domain that they're less familiar with, like tweets. Setting aside the issues, which are major issues, we now have our data in a format where we could use a classifier. And we have a choice that's often very intimidating to students, which is which algorithm should we choose? They all have kind of intimidating names. It's kind of unclear where these different algorithms. And actually, if you ask different people, they'll tell you different things. So two approaches that I really like. One is to look at what other people are doing. And the website Kaggle actually released a survey of the machine learning methods that real practitioners used. And there's quite a number of popular methods for different use cases. But I think the methods at the top are the ones that we should consider first. The second method is to look at this excellent flowchart made by Scikit. And if you really walk through this flowchart, I think you'll always get to a reasonable conclusion. Maybe not the very best possible algorithm, but certainly a reasonable algorithm to start with. So let's walk through this flowchart together. We start at the yellow circle. And then it asks us, do we have greater than 50 samples of training data? We do. I think it's kind of funny what it says if we don't. It says get more data, which I think is good advice. It doesn't recommend any algorithm, but we do. So then it says, OK, are you predicting a category? Are we predicting a category? What do you guys think? Yeah. yeah? Sometimes students argue that we're not predicting a category. Any thoughts on why they might say that? There could be a range of emotions. Yeah, exactly. So there could you could think of it as kind of like a range or a scale of like you know very positive, somewhat positive, neutral, negative. So, you know, so so there are kind of two ways to look at it. But I think category is a little simpler, and it works a little better with sentiment typically because in some ways positive is closer to negative than positive is closer to neutral. If that makes sense. So we'll say we are predicting a category, and then it asks, do we have labeled data? And actually, yeah, we do have labeled data here. And then it says, OK, do you have less than 100,000 samples? And we do have less than 100,000 samples. We have, I think, 9,000 samples we saw. And so then it recommends what's called a linear SVC, which is a, another way of saying SVM. And this is kind of funny, because it actually has an arrow coming out of that which says, not working, question mark. And I have to say, when I try this with default parameters on this data set, it actually doesn't work very well. <laughs> so I think this sort of shows how these things are fairly squishy. And in this case, the linear SVC with defaults doesn't work well. And I kind of know why, but I don't want to get into it. So let's just follow the not working error. Let's say you didn't know anything and you tried it and it didn't work. And then it says, OK, are you dealing with text data? And in fact, we are dealing with text data. It was originally text data. Now it's numbers. And then it recommends naive Bayes. So naive Bayes sounds like a simple algorithm. And it is a simple algorithm. But it works really well, and it's really fast. So it's a really fun one to start with. And actually, if you go to the link, these boxes are clickable, and it'll give you demo code to actually run each one of these algorithms. But we can go back into classifier.py, and we can see where I put in a naive Bayes algorithm. So on line 24, 
from sklearn, scikit-learn, dot naive Bayes, I import multinomial NB, which is one type of naive Bayes classifier. And then I make a variable NB that I set equal to multinomial NB. Then in line 27, I call NB.fit, and I pass in the counts, which is this matrix of counts of words occurring in tweets, and then target, which is the thing that we're trying to classify. So this would be positive sentiment, negative sentiment, or neutral sentiment. And then in line 30, I actually try the classifier. So I call nb.predict. And now I can't call nb.predict on the text itself because this classifier can only run on numbers. So I actually have to call nb.predict and then I have to use that count underscore vec dot transform to turn text into numbers. And I pass in a string, a sample tweet, which in this case is I hate my iPhone. So let's see if that works. So I run python classifier.py, and it actually builds a model here, and it actually does predict negative emotion. So that certainly seems promising. Or you might think I picked a canned example that would work well. So we built a simple, fast text classifier. And there's a whole bunch of awesome places to go from here. I usually spend a whole day on these classes, and I can take this in lots of different directions. I think the next thing that I would recommend someone to do if they're really trying to make this classifier work in the real world is measure its performance. I mean, just because it worked on I hate my iPhone, and spoiler, it works on I love my iPhone, doesn't mean that it's really going to work on the real types of tweets that you actually see in the real world. And so the best way to deal with that is to build an end-to-end -end system to measure performance. So we can split the data into some test data and some training data and see how well this classifier performs. Once we have a sense of how well it's performing, then there's lots of things to do to improve this classifier. There are some suggestions from the audience here on how to improve it, maybe um, handle emojis, maybe encode the order of words. Um, there's fancier things we could do, like make LSTMs or CNNs or kind of fancier algorithms. And there's actually a lot in between. And there's something called grid search that you can use to look over lots and lots of different possibilities and find the thing that's going to work the best on your task. Scikit-learn has a lot of really excellent built-in methods to do this. And if you look around in the ML-class uh, repository that I have, you'll find lots of good examples that you can draw from. And if you post some comments and request more, I'm sure we'll make lots of excellent videos beyond this that'll take you further down the path of text classifying with machine learning. Guys, I love, I love feedback, especially positive <laughs> feedback. <laughs> If you, if you watch these videos and you make anything interesting or cool, that's really the thing that motivates me. So tell me about it. Put it in the comment or message me on Twitter. I'm L2K.